So I have uh, 90 minutes uh, to talk to you. Um, and uh, so I decided to uh, divide my uh, time into two parts. So I will talk about uh, two subjects, which are both related to modeling uh, neutral evolution of DNA. Um, so I will first talk about uh, nucleotide exchanges, like uh, changing an A or C to a C or whatsoever, and how this can be modeled. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the mathematical frameworks. So that is uh, more on an introductory sli uh, side. Um, <coughs> so I will first talk about the models and then also how we can use them now to, to estimate mutation rates. So and then in the second part of the talk, I will change to different processes. So these are processes which <coughs> actually uh, take pieces of DNA and reinsert them into the DNA again, into the genome again. And, uh, and what, they, what such processes actually do to uh, the statistics, uh, to some statistics of uh, genomes. And that would be then a story about evolutionary stick breaking. Um, so t stay tuned, even if the first part is a little bit boring. It's at least boring for me, but probably not for you. Uh, hopefully not for you. But anyway, so if, you, if, if there are any questions, please interrupt me at any stage. Um, so, so I usually uh, start my talks uh, showing the slides. So this is, uh, I don't know, what, what, what you would see in, in a, under a microscope if you look, into, uh, look at uh, human DNA. So here we have the chromosomes as we all know them. Chromosome 1 is longer than uh, 22, and so on, and sex chromosomes. Uh, so people uh, know, know about these chromosomes for, say, 100, uh, hundreds of years now. And uh, of course, we are wondering, OK, wh what is actually in there? Um, so and then there were some, f the first biochemical analysis uh, were actually done by, by some people and Shagaf is one of the first ones so and he coined uh, what is now known as uh, Shagaf's first parity rule and he took the double-stranded DNA molecule so by that time it was actually not known that it was double-stranded so he took the DNA molecule and he showed that there are uh, amino acids, uh, nucleotides in there and he showed or he proposed that uh, Okay, on this molecule or in this molecule, you have equal amounts of A's and T's and C's and G's. And okay, and, and he stated this actually three years before Watson and Crick found the biochemical structure of this molecule. And um, after this uh, identification of this uh, structure, of course, it's um, I don't know this Shagaf's first parity rule is of course a triviality. Um, so because, as you know, all timines are paired with adenosines and all cytosines is, are paired with guanine along the, um, across the uh, double strands. Um, but Chagaf uh, was smart enough to uh, coin another second parity rule. And now he uh, knew how to separate the two, stingle, uh, these two strands. And then he said, uh, and he found that, okay, even along one single-stranded DNA molecule, there are more or less equal amounts of A's and T's and C's and G's. And it took another 10 years to come up with this rule. Um, yes? Exactly, that was also the question I, <laughs> I was thinking about and a lot of other people. So the question was, okay, wh why should that be true? And um, yeah, and I will, uh, so a good part of my first part of the talk will now be devoted to, to answering this question. But uh, yeah, but it's, it's only, okay, so, so sometimes it's only these uh, curious um, observations people make about say, some statistics of genomes um, which lead to new, I don't know, models and developments to, to I don't know, be, to be able to, uh, 
yeah, make sense out of those observations. So, so this is one of those observations. I will come in my second part of the talk. I will also give you another observation, which is also very puzzling, uh, but which uh, can be, I don't know, can be very, is in the end very trivial if you have the right model. So, okay, so this is just an illustration. So this is some uh, random part of the human chromosome one. And so on this picture, uh, so on this, uh, in this sequence, you see as more or less, okay, it's about 1500 A's and T's and about 950 C's and G's. So it's, okay, it's not exactly true, of course, this, this parity rule, but it's, it's roughly true. So and of course, if you go on a genomic scale, then it gets even better. Um, so, but, but to explain this parity rule, um, we actually have to think about evolution now and the dynamics, how um, DNA evolves in time. So, and for, for that reason, I want to, so to say, uh, ma model this process as a Markov model, which is a, a very good approximation because, of course, the genome today doesn't know about the state, say, one million years ago or 10 days ago even. Uh, it, it, all this information is lost. So, um, um, so a Markov model is actually a very appropriate model to do this. So and the, the four players, okay, so a Markov model always has some states and the states in our case are of course the four nucleotides A, C, G and T um, as shown here. And then um, more often, uh, so, so then most often you actually observe what, is, what are now called uh, transitions. So these are exchanges of A and G uh, and back or T and C. And these occur more often because uh, these two nucleotides actually share uh, the same chemical structure. So these have two rings here and these two have just one ring. So it's just easier to exchange one nucleotide by another because you just have to exchange some side groups here, but you don't have to do some major changes and to, I don't know, get another ring or get rid of another ring. Um, so and then all the rest uh, are called transversions. So these are uh, all these processes here. Um, so, but in principle, these are 12 independent biochemical processes, right? So these are uh, four, different ray, uh, four different players. So these are 12 different processes. And so in principle, we, we would need to have 12 different mutation rates. Okay, and I call these rates Q, beta, alpha. Um, which are, okay, a rate is always a probability for per time. So in, in this case, it's a probability to see an alpha exchanged by beta in some time interval dt over the length of the time interval. So that's the usual de definition of a rate in physics. Um, so if we have that, um, then we can, of course, start our mathematical description, okay, as a Markov process. So, so we have, okay, in general, okay, in general, okay, this is for general Markov processes. So um, for, for DNA, we just have n equal to 4 here. So you have a finite state space, um, and then you s just specify all the rates. So the rate for going from i to j, which, as I said, is the probability over this, the length of the time interval. And then, of course, you take the, uh, the limit for small time intervals. And then you can arrange all these rates into a matrix. So, and I do it like that, so that the from index, so that here are the two indices, <coughs> and here on the vertical are the from indices. So, um, yeah, so, and, okay, the, you don't have any uh, rates on the diagonal because there's no, okay, I, I don't specify a rate from going from A to A, right? So this is, if the nucleotide stays the same, there's no rate associated to it. So, but for, for mathematical purposes, uh, we just make this uh, the diagonal as such that if you uh, sum over one column, this column should add up to zero. Um, 
And this actually becomes handy, I guess, on my next slide, in one of my next slides, because then we can actually write a master equation for such a system. Um, okay, so um, okay, so, so this is okay. I guess the, the background of that slide changed, so it's more red. So which means, okay, this is more an, probably an application, if you, uh, or it's a side remark. Um, so, okay, what, what I have defined right now is just, okay, you know all the rates of the system, so, but now you, what you can already do is you can simulate the system. So you can do some kinetic Monte Carlo simulations of any system you, you have if you just have the rates. And this is just a, some little recipe. So, what you, okay, so you, you, you start your system at, say, time zero, and then, um, you just tabulate all the possible processes which can all go on in your, in your system. Um, and then you build this, whoops, cumulative uh, rate function, whatever. So if you have, say, okay, let's, uh, for, for an example, if you, if you start with A, then, okay, for, in this case, you have three rates you have to consider. It's uh, the rate from A to C, the rate from A to G, and the rate from uh, A to T. And then you just sum them up, um, and that would be capital R of uh, three, because you just have three rates. Um, and then, okay, in, in your kinetic Monte Carlo, you just have to uh, step the time. So the next thing you, you have to do is you have to advance this time, and um, for the next process to occur, you have to, there's an exponential waiting time associated with that, and you can just um, get such an exponential waiting time by just uh, drawing a random number v between 0 and 1. You just take 1 over v, the logarithm of that, you divide that by r3 in this case, and that would be your time advance. So then you advance the time, and then um, you have to execute, so to say, one of those uh, processes, and you do that with uh, the relative rates they occur with. So say, okay, if, if you just, okay, if this is R3, uh, this is zero, then okay, say this is R, the rate from A to C, which is larger than the others, so this would be the rate from uh, A to G, and this from rate from A to T. So what you do is, again, okay, that is in this recipe for there, um, you just take a uniform random number between zero and R3 and just check where it lands. And if, you, if it lands here, then you do this, execute this step, and that's it. And then you go back to two, you just make a list of all possible processes um, and advance your time until you reach some uh, time you want to end your computation. So this is okay. Well, what a computer scientist would do probably um, to, to get an idea, and which is always a good idea, to, uh, to get a first idea how such a system behaves. So this is known as kinetic Monte Carlo, where you can read in books and Wikipedia about it. Um, so, <clears throat> but, uh, but as a physicist, of course, you want to do some equations. Um, so, um, and here I just want to derive now the master equation. So, um, what you do here is, um, so you, you, you define a state vector, which I call rho now. Um, so this is a vector. And it has components uh, rho a, rho c, rho g, and rho t, which are the probabilities um, to find the system um, at time t in this state. So say if you start with just one a and you know okay, there's an A, then this probability would be just one, zero, zero, zero. So if you, um, 
if you initialize your system in a, in a given state, in a pure state, then that it means that you know that you have an A there, then rho would be uh, this vector. So and then, <coughs> okay, so this master equation now is, is an, uh, will be a, an equation, a differential equation for, for this vector rho of t. And for one component here, you can see that um, there are, okay, so this rho of, rho of i, i would be a, c, u, g, or t. It's a, it's a next time step, de delta t. Okay, it's a sum of three processes, or sum of three terms. Um, so either nothing happens in your system. So that means uh, you just copy whatever is uh, rho of, of your previous, in your previous time step. Or if there's some, something happening, some, uh, some nucleotide are exchanged, then you actually have to take care of that. So in the probability that, an ex that you have an exchange from k to i, so this is the ra rate q i k i, so you have a gain of probability if, say, a c somewhere else uh, um, changes to an a. So then you would have an influx of probability here. Um, and that, of course, is this influx is proportional to its rate and the time interval you are considering this. Um, so this is a gain of probability, but you also lose probability if there are A's which uh, are exchanged by other nucleotides. So in this probability is proportional to the number of A's, the rate of A's going to somewhere else times the time interval. Um, so, um, okay, and because we had this very uh, nice matrix notification, uh, notation, um, we actually can write this equation uh, in this form. Um, so that the rho from at t plus delta t is equal to rho of t plus delta t times q, this matrix, times rho. So, and the diagonal terms take, take uh, take care of the loss of probabilities and the off-diagonal terms um, <coughs> model the gain of probabilities. Um, and then of course you can, uh, okay, you can just sub sub subtract rho and divide by delta t and uh, get this differential equation out of it, um, which is the master equation of our system. Um, so, Okay, and this master equation is of course very simple because, okay, everyone knows, uh, okay, this is a first order differential equation and everyone knows how to solve it. If it would be just a differential equation for one func for a function, um, but the solution, okay, then it would be the exponential function as everyone knows, so if q would be a number, but the solution is uh, also the exponential function if q is a matrix as it's shown here. So, but but this matrix, so this is now the matrix exponential of uh, the matrix Q times T. So T would be the, the time, um, which is just defined by its Taylor series. So you can define this Taylor, you can just execute this Taylor series, of course, also for matrices. Um, so and what rho of tau, uh, rho, rho of T is now, Okay, this, so this is, if you, okay, if rho of zero is, say, this, this state here, uh, so rho of t is just, what did I wrote? Um, exponential q times t, capital T, rho of uh, zero. So this uh, takes your initial state um, and gives you the final state after some time, after some final time t. Um, ah, okay. So this is also for for, guy, for, for those of you who uh, want to do some simulations or want to do some something more uh, uh, numerically. Okay, it's actually not easy. 
to, um, to compute this uh, matrix exponential of, uh, for, for some matrix, uh, okay, here it's A. Um, and that's because, uh, okay, if you take the Taylor series, this uh, Taylor series, the convergence of this Taylor series is very slow uh, if the norm of A is greater than one. Um, so this is a big hassle because uh, then you have to, I don't know, take thousands of terms and that gets computationally expensive. So the little trick you should do is um, you, you just uh, note that E, the exponential of A, is uh, just the exponential of A over M times M. So, and then you do, uh, you choose M such that the A over M, the norm of A over M, the, ma uh, the norm of this matrix is smaller than one. So then this exponential actually uh, converges fast. And then you take this matrix to the mth power. And if you're really smart, then you choose m to, to be a power of 2, because then in the end you just have to square the matrix at the very end. Um, so the, all, all this and related algorithms um, about uh, matrix exponential are all found in this paper, Moller and uh, Van Loon. And the, and the title of this paper is 19 dubious ways to compute the exponential of a matrix. So, okay, if you ever want to do this, then remember this title and you will get this paper. Um, but of course, there's also um, packages which already does do, do all this for you. Um, so in Python, there's a function you can just call. And so there's also implement implementations in C++. Um, but Ah, and just, okay, just that you know, okay, so the matrix exponential is not the, the exponential of all matrix elements. So it's not element-wise exponential, right? So you have to... <coughs> okay, so this was a little digression. Uh, so we come back to our um, Markov processes again. So, and, okay, then there's this... Um, some properties for of Markov processes you can think about. And okay, the first one is uh, the, uh, that there could be a, a stationary state, or most Markov processes actually have a stationary state. Um, so that is a state where, uh, now denoted as pi, where the, um, the time evolution actually doesn't change anymore. So um, that means that if you, uh, execute, or uh, if you take this matri uh, matrix Q on pi, then this would give zero. That means that your, this state uh, stays constant in time. Um, okay, another property would, that, w w would be that of detailed balance. And okay, this is, if you are in a stationary state, and then, um, Okay, you, you just take two states here, uh, x and y, and then you count. So you, you just look at those two states, and then you, you, how, how you count how many changes from x to y and from y to x do I observe in my system. And um, if this, okay, these numbers are, okay, it's a probability to be in state x and to go from x to y, and the probability, so this is one number, and the other number from y to x is the probability to be in y and to go from y to x. So these two numbers. And if these two numbers are the same for all x and y, then your system uh, is in, in detailed balance um, or also reversible. And what that means is that you can take a movie off from, from your system and in, your st in the stationary state and if you, and then after you took the movie, you cannot decide if you play it back or uh, forward. Um, because, okay, yeah, you would see three pandas going from, or three, <laughs> three uh, nucleotide, or three exchanges in this direction, or also three in this direction. Um, so a system where this is actually not true would be something where, where you have a current. So, so if you have three states and you have particles going just in one direction. So this would be a non-reversible state, but it could still be a, 
um, Markov process. So such a system doesn't have, doesn't uh, <coughs> fulfill the detailed balance condition. Okay, so so this was uh, our mathematical um, framework to now come to DNA, uh, the modeling of DNA evolution. So these are our four players, as I said. Okay, and we have these 12 rates. Um, but of course, historically, uh, people didn't have 12 parameters in their models. They just started simple. And um, so the first model was actually the one by Jukes and Cantor in 1969. So and here, the rate matrix um, just contains one parameter, and that is the mutation rate. So um, that's just one parameter, and okay, on the diagonal we have minus three Q, so that such that all the columns add up to zero. And then you can also compute the matrix exponential. In this case, you can do that analytically, um, and this is given by this matrix. So the off-diagonal terms are now a little bit more complicated, but these are uh, it's given here. And the P matrices are, so this is a P matrix, so which is the, just the matrix exponential. Um, and here's actually the columns add up to one. Um, so that's uh, one property of such a matrix. Um, so, ah, yeah, okay. So, and <coughs> so in this P matrix, uh, the, the nice thing about this matrix, P is actually, okay, as I said, so this is, okay, um, so this is the matrix P of T, and the matrix elements, of course, so if you um, prepare your, uh, your system in a pure state, and then you ask, okay, what is the probability that I go from i to j in a given amount of fi uh, a finite time t, then this would be um, just the p of t, this matrix. And in this matrix, it would be the j i i s element. And you can just see that, so you, have, you prepare your system in, in, in state i, so that gives you this, uh, this uh, row number, and you ask, okay, what is the probability to end up in j? So you, you are just inquiring about the j's component of, of this vector. So and then you, s you see that, okay, the probabilities, so the transition probabilities in, in this Markov process are just given by all the matrix elements of this P matrix, um, which will become handy in a minute. So, okay, here we can also see that, okay, this solution actually makes sense. Um, so in blue, I guess I have the probability that you, you start in a state and I end up in a, in a different state. So blue could be the probability to start the probability starting in A and uh, to find a C after starting in A. So you, at time zero, of course, if you start in, in C, you don't see an A, um, so, but this probability will increase to one quarter after some time. And then it um, uh, saturates here because, of course, if you, once you change to A, you can also change to G and so on. So in, in, for very long times, uh, all the ba all bases will uh, come with equal probability, so this has to saturate at one quarter. And the probability to, if you start with an A, that you're still an A after some time T, of course, has to decrease and also uh, go, go to one quarter. And the stationary state um, is easily just one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. Um, <coughs> So this, is, so this was uh, the, the simplest and, uh, model, just having one rate, um, the jukes Cantor model. So then, of course, people realized, um, okay, there are actually two timescales uh, working in nucleotide substitutions. And as I said, so people observed 
that there are more transitions so than transversions observed. Um, so the next, uh, someone, uh, uh, Kimura came around and uh, just invented this uh, Kimura two-parameter model where now all the transition, uh, the transition processes now have this rate kappa. So every, everything, everyone has the rate Q and just the transitions have the rate kappa times Q and kappa is uh, supposed to be larger than one. Um, so that this would, uh, this matrix would take care of uh, transition bias in nucleotide substitutions. But unfortunately, the uh, stationary state is still one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, <coughs> which is not, which is actually not what is observed in, in genomic sequences. So say the human genome has a GC content, that is G plus C content of 42%. So this is not 50% as, as it would come out of this model. So, and therefore now a lot of more models were invented to, I don't know, to cover all this feature we see in genomes. So and the next one is then the Felsenstein model. I guess it's from 81 or 83. So here now you can specify the, the stationary state. So the stationary state is just given by those four numbers pi a, pi c, pi g, pi d. Um, so you can specify those four numbers. Of course, they have to add up to one. And then this matrix will be a, a nucleotide exchange process, uh, will model a nucleotide exchange process, which leads to this stationary state distribution. And even in this case, you can actually also um, calculate this matrix P which uh, to, to get all the probabilities to go from I to J. Um, so, but okay, but this is actually the last model, so to say, where, where you can calculate these probabilities analytically for all the, uh, for all the coming models, you, you cannot do that anymore. Um, so then of course, okay, so now you, you took care of the stationary state distribution, but you, you lost uh, everything about transition and transversions. So then uh, Hasegawa, Kishino, and Yano okay, came up with a now so-called HKY model, which also takes care of the, uh, that there are more transitions observed than transversions. So, so they introduced this parameter kappa again, um, and so on. Okay, then there's, okay a plethora of models now. So everyone wants to put his name. I guess you just invented a model and you had your name <laughs> in this model. It was a nice time. <laughs> um, so Tumura Ne came 93. So, okay, they just have two transition rates. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, okay, this is another matrix. Um, I guess you can see the slides in the very end. You will get them on the web page, uh, so you don't have to write everything down. So this is a general time reversible model. So this model has, you can specify the stationary state distribution and you have six additional parameters and it's guaranteed that this model is uh, reversible, time reversible. So whenever you do a movie, you can't see whether it's forward or backward. Um, okay, but okay, there's one other model now which also makes, uh, um, takes care of a, of a symmetry in, on, in biology and that is, um, okay, the symmetry is that, okay, or that, uh, okay, DNA is a double strand and we actually didn't take this into account <coughs> up to now. Um, so, but we can also take this into account that DNA is a double strand. So, okay, say you have an initial state where you have just have a T and an A there on the forward strand, and of course the base pair strand is the same configuration, it's T A uh, on the backward strand. So then imagine that, okay, this T changes to C due to some mutation. Then of course um, there's a base mismatch here and biology actually takes care of those base mismatches and it will try to correct this configuration. So, and here now it can do two things. So it can either say, okay, 
Of course, it doesn't know what was the original configuration. So it can either do two things. Either it can say, ah, oh, this, this A is not correct. I would probably rather stick in G in here to get the right Watson and Crick base pairing again. Or it can say, ah, oh, this A is correct. And uh, probably the C is incorrect. So I exchange that by a T. So, and the probabilities for the two, those two processes are, of course, one half, one half, because it doesn't know what is the correct, uh, what is the correct initial state. So, so with rate q over 2, you actually end up here in this state where you have uh, the base uh, fully exchanged on the forward and the backward strand. And with, uh, with you, you can also end up in this state where you actually don't see the, the mutation anymore. But of course, the same process that uh, t to c uh, transition can also occur on the backward strand. And then it occurs here at this t. And also here, the same thing can happen. So repair comes along, sees some base mismatch, and has to do something. Um, so in here, you see, OK, so you end up here in this state also with rate q over 2 because these queues are the same, and here it's always one half, one half decisions. Um, so, but now follow this t here. So this t is exchanged by c with rate q over 2. But if we, OK, we just now concentrate on the forward strand, because we always analyze one strand. So this a was also exchanged by g here with the same rate, q over 2, right? So forget about the backward strand. Just look on the forward strand. So here we had a t to c, and here an a to g. But they occur both with the same rate. And that's because two strands have to change. And there's a repair mechanism which takes care that those two strands are always in, in, in symmetry. So those two rates actually have to be the same if you just measure uh, mutations on the forward strand. So and this gives, of, gives you, of course, conditions on, on all pairs of rates. Um, and there's a matrix for that. Um, and this is, I come to your question, um, and this is uh, this here. So you have, uh, say, here QAG, and this same parameter also occurs here. So, OK, but now you. Uh, <coughs> okay, okay I, I come to symmetry breaking of that. Uh, okay, the question is whether we are sure that um, the repair me mechanism is, uh, doesn't know or is symmetric. And um, okay, of course we are not, but okay, as the, okay, as, as the DNA is floating around in the OK, that's, okay for, for, the, for the repair process, there's no way to distinguish the forward and the backward strand if the DNA is just floating around in, in the cell, in the nucleus. So because it doesn't know what strand we call the forward strand and what we call the backward strand. But there are certain situations where um, it can actually distinguish forward and backward strands, and I come to that in, in 10 minutes. Oh, OK, I have to speed up. Um, OK, so this is a matrix. It just has six parameters. Um, OK, and the stationary state is given by this expression. OK, no big deal. Um, ha, but OK, in the stationary state, we now have this property that pi c is equal to pi g and pi a is equal to pi t. That means in the stationary state, you find the, 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 the amount of a's and equals to the amount of t's, and the amount of c's equals to the amount of g's. So and that is Chagas' second parity rule, as you remember. So Chagas' second parity rule is just a consequence of that DNA is double strand and evolved for a long time so that on average, or that we can, so, so that genomic DNA is more or less in a stationary state. 
So in, in, in such a state, you would always see equal amounts of C's and G's and A's and T's. But of course, okay, of course our DNA is not in a stationary state with whatever model, um, uh, but we are close to it. Okay, and our genomes evolved for a very long time, say millions of years after we came from bacteria. So this is the reason we, we see uh, uh, Chagraf's second parity rule. Yes? This rule is that at uh, one particular time, hmm? if you get a time equal zero, uh, you will have the same amount of uh, T, A, G, and C. No? Uh, no. No, I guess we, no, okay, we, we probably we started from some bacteria and uh, uh, this bacteria had probably 60% A's and T's and, I don't know, 40% C's and G's. So you, but, but after some time, okay, after, okay, or it, it would even, I don't know, so, so small genomes, of course, have, there's different, okay, I, I come to, okay, I, I come to all this, but uh, it just means, okay, that we, okay, our genomes have a lot of probably intergenic DNA which doesn't have any function anymore, which evolved for a very long time and these pieces of DNA reached a stationary state. But of course, I don't know, this, this mutation process will also change in time because repair processes change. So, uh, okay, there's a lot of complications to that. But, um, but you would, as long as the repair process is symmetric, you actually always find uh, these situations. So there's, there's no organism where you don't verify this uh, prediction? Where you don't verify it. Okay, I come to violations in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, scale, so yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good con. Which, which, which uh, mechanism is the most uh, relevant? Like this correction mechanism or this inversion? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, so it actually, did, okay. So the, the the point raised is that inversions would also equilibrate it, uh, equilibrate. Um, and I guess it depends how, how many base pairs are affected by inversions compared to uh, nucleotide substitutions. So if you have per time, um, that I don't know. Be because you don't have as many inversions by number as nucleotide exchanges. But of course, if an inversion, uh, I don't know, inverts 1 MB, then of course, I don't know, it, it has a big influence. But it's a good point. Okay, um, so, but the most, 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 most general model is, of course, this one with 12 parameters. Uh, but uh, a lot of people don't uh, consider this model because it is so parameter rich. Um, uh, but, and, and you need a lot of data to, so to say, do, to estimate all the rates. Um, but nowadays we actually have this data and we could consider and we will consider this model in, in what I, tell you next. So okay, so this was the mathematical framework and now I just show you some more applications. Okay, I, I skip over that. Okay, should I skip? Okay, there's, okay so if you, if, you, if you consider vertebrate DNA, um, then vertebrates have, have this special neighbor dependent process. So there's CPG methylation deamination so CPGs actually tend to be methylated. So if you have a C and a G next to it, next to each other, then this C tends to be methylated. So this is shown here. So this is cytosine, and this is methylated cytosine. It has this amine group he here. So it, it just has to lose this amine, uh, this methyl group. So it just has to lose this amine group to become a thymine. So in this deamination occurs very often. So then you have a C. G to TG here, there's a cytosine deamination, and this rate Q is very high. And then, of course, the repair thing com comes along and so on. But okay, in, in general, you have CGs going to either CAs or TGs. And this rate is actually 
10 times higher than any other mutation rate in, in, vertebrate, uh, in eukaryotic uh, DNA. So, and that's just because, I don't know, C2Z, CPGs tend to be methylated out of um, uh, yeah, regulatory reasons, because you can shut off, so to say, genes if you, if you methylate them. So and this process is often used, and therefore this, pro this, uh, this mutation often happens. There was a question. Yes, because they have they use uh, methylation as uh, for regulatory purposes. So that's of course there's also methylation in bacteria, but there it's also that's used for I guess for proofreading. Yeah. Um, okay, in this case, you actually you have to enlarge your state space. So it, you, you cannot just consider, I don't know, a 4 by 4 matrix, but you have to consider, I don't know, two nucleotides together. So you, you have to consider now a 16 by 16 matrix, which has, I don't know, entries from AA, AC, AG to TT. And the matrix looks a little more, co more complicated because, okay these, okay, these are all the processes which just exchange one nucleotide. So you, you just want to allow one nucleotide exchanges. So not that, I don't know, two of them changes. Um, and okay, so you can write those, the, these matrices on uh, two or three sides. You can just write them as this. So you have just the one side dynamics um, on, one stay, on one side uh, plus the, uh, times the identity on the other. Uh, plus the identity on the first state and, and, the one, and the one dynamics on the second, and so on. So you can write down these more complicated um, matrices. So this would be a 16 by 16, and this for three sides, it would be a 64 by 64 matrix. And the tensor product is just defined like that. Um, so it gets a little bit more complicated, but uh, all the math can still be done. So once you have this matrix Q, you just take the matrix exponential and you have the transition probabilities. That's it. You don't need to need more. So, and okay, the transition probabilities um, are, okay, so in the neighbor independent case, you can just write uh, P2 is uh, just this and P3 this. But if you have, okay, if you have these neighbor dependencies now, then you introduce these, I don't know, uh, these enhancement factors for the CPG process, and that this would change the matrix on, on those two positions. So this is CP, CPG to CA and CPG to TG. So these two entries become, uh, just get this additional factor. Um, but this matrix Q, you cannot now, you, you cannot express as just as, I don't know, a sum of uh, simple tensor products. Um, so you have to consider this matrix and you have to do the matrix exponential there. Okay, so, so everything gets a little bit more complicated, but okay, also neighbor dependencies can, can easily be included into such models. Um, so, okay, but now the, the big question is of course, okay, how do we measure those rates? And for this, you can, okay, and I guess Thierry al already introduced that, you, can, you, use, you just use a maximum likelihood approach. So, okay, we, we, ignore, the pri we ignore prior information uh, right now. So that is, okay, we are the first ones to analyze this genome. So there is no prior information. And then we just have to uh, maximize the likelihood of the data given a model. Okay, and this likelihood function is actually very simple. Okay, if you, ju if you just deal with neighbor independent processes, um, the probability of the data given a model is just the probability, okay, you have two, two, two sequences, alpha and beta here. Um, so it's the probability that the sequence alpha evolved to the sequence beta under this model, which is just factorizes into the product of, okay, that alpha i changes to beta i under the model. Okay, these probabilities we know, so these are matrix elements in our p matrix. So this is the alpha i element 
beta i alpha i element in this matrix, um, which can be computed uh, with this matrix exponential. And you just have to product uh, the product over all sides. So that's easily done. Um, okay, you can also include neighbor dependencies, but now you have to, okay, instead of, okay, so the probability of the data given a model is now, it, it can, okay, it, it does not factorize exactly, but it uh, this uh, factorized uh, um, solution is actually very good. So you can factorize this probability in a product over all sides i, um, and then you just have to consider here the probabilities that this triplet ATG changes to something, this, the base in the middle something. So, and then. Okay, these probabilities that a triplet goes to something, star, beta, something, uh, it's just, I don't know, you just marginalize the three state probabilities um, on, the beat, on beta one and beta three. So these can also easily be computed and then you just slide this window across the sequence and just count, okay, how many, wh what configurations do I see here? So and that, um, so this, with this, uh, you you can easily compu uh, compute the likelihood, and then also maximize the likelihood in your parameter space. So there are algorithms, even if your function, uh, even if your likelihood function um, depends on twelve parameters, can easily maximize this uh, function. But of course, in our situation here. We need to know the ancestral state, right? Alpha is supposed to be known. Um, and of course, in, in evolutionary, if you do an evolutionary analysis, you don't have access to, say, the human genome 10 million years ago. Okay, so the, at that time we didn't sequence our genome, um, which would be very nice if we would have it. Um, but um, Okay, but here we can use some trick, and um, so, okay, this uh, leads me to a quote by some famous um, French uh, scientist, uh, Georges-Louis Leclerc, uh, um, the Count of de Buffon, um, and he said that if animals did not exist, the nature of man would even be more, would even more incomprehensible. So, and um, I think what he means is uh, we should compare humans to others, um, and that means a comparative analysis in genomics. So, say alpha is a human and beta is chimpanzee and uh, gamma is some macaque. So we now have genomes of all three species. We can align them so we know, okay, which, which parts are homologous. Um, and then we know, okay, these three genomes evolved under a common model from some ancestor of all these three species uh, along such a phylogenetic tree. And of course we don't know these sequences here in the, in the inner nodes because these are ancestral co uh, configurations. So, but we can, we can just, okay, and these are the models. Okay, there, there could be different models on each branch, right? Because chimpanzees mutate different than other, uh, than humans um, because of uh, differences in uh, repair processes and so we can write down the probability to to see such an alignment of this ba base alpha i, beta i and gamma i and this is just given by a product of all these probabilities to, ex uh, to evolve along those branches and because we don't know the ancestral states we just have to sum over them so, and this is expressed by this sum. Um, so, and this is actually everything we need to know. Now we just take alignments of human, chimp, and macaque, say, and just measure those. We just write down this likelihood, maximize it, and uh, can measure all these rates. Okay, now, of course, our, uh, the pro parameter space of our models uh, increased by a factor of four because we have four models to optimize over. Anyway, um, 
Okay, but okay, this is easily done, and um, okay, I, I skip this in the interest of time. So okay, just just a proof that the algorithm uh, we we propose is actually a good one. So you can actually compute what is the error you expect from such an exp if you have finite uh, finite sequence lengths, and of course you expect errors um, due to the finite size, and the errors are exactly as large as you would expect them. So, um, so our, our algorithm is actually uh, quite good. Um, so, but that brings me just, um, so, so, yes? No, no, you don't have to do that. Um, so this will, will come out uh, automatically. So there's no, no other constraints. So you can have 12 parameters on all, in all of these four models, M1 to M4. And um, everything comes out. OK. OK, I have to speed up because I want to talk about the second uh, thing, which is much more interesting. OK. <laughs> OK, so okay, Shagar's second parity rule is actually violated. OK, every, okay. every rule in biology has an exception. So that's uh, w one rule in biology. And OK, here, OK, so this is some bacterial genome. Um, and this is the ACGT content. And you see that, OK, there's more C's, no, more G's than C's on this half. Okay, bacterial genomes come in circles. So um, here you see there's more G's than C's and the other way around on this here, on, on the other half of the circle. And also the AT content makes some uh, uh, violations. Um, so the, the origin of this uh, violation is actually known, and that's because, OK, bacterial genomes um, are uh, replicated just from one origin of replication. And then there's one half, this half of the circle is, is so you have a bacterial genome. So there's one um, origin of repli replication. And then the two halves, this half and the other one, are actually processed differently. So there's uh, here you have Ozaki, Ozaki fragments on one strand, on, on the other is uh, replicated continuously, while it's the other way around on the, uh, if you go into this direction. So and that actually introduces a direction into the, into the two strands, and that's why you get uh, violations of Shagraf's second parity rule in bacterial genomes. Yes, exactly, because uh, of these Ozaki fragments. Um, OK, we also see violations in the human genome um, in if you just consider transcripts. So OK, I just pulled out all the transcripts of the human genome and measured the ATCG content in front of the gene and in the, in the coding uh, part of the gene. So this includes. In the coding, uh, so this is uh, exon and introns. Um, and you see that upstream of a gene, uh, Shagraf's second parity rule is fulfilled, while downstream it is actually violated. And that's because, of course, the transcribed, uh, transcribed gene, OK, the uh, gene which is transcribed, of course, the, there the organism knows, OK, which is the forward strand or the transcribed strand and the, templ the template or non-template strand. So there, the two strands are not, sim uh, are not equivalent anymore. Um, so we wanted to find out about this. So OK, possible processes, of course, OK, either the mutation, mutations have a bias, so that OK, while the polymerase is sliding along this branch, it could introduce more or less uh, mutations in, in one of the strands. This could be a reason. 
But you can also have uh, a biased repair process so that the template strand or non-template strand is more often repaired than the other. Um, so, but this would all lead to, to differences so that the reverse complement pairs of base uh, of nucleotide exchanges are not similar to each other anymore, which then leads to violations. Okay. No, there is no selection going on. So it's just okay. It's just that okay. While the gene is transcribed, the two strands are actually distinguishable because on one strand, uh, on one strand, you th there's a polymerase, and on the other there's no polymerase. So a, rep a repair process can actually say, okay, I want to keep the transcribed strand. That is always the good base, and I would always. Uh, repair the non-template strand and not the template strand. But the asymmetry could arise from selection and not maybe the mutational repair. Yeah, 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 it could, yes, yes, yeah. If you have bias, then it won't survive. Yeah, okay, yes. If you, okay, yeah, if you have, yeah, if you have a strongly deleterious mutation, then yes, that could be the case, yeah. Anyway, so, so you just pull out data from human, chimp, and macaque. Um, so and you, you just have to do that across all genes because you need a lot of data to, to measure all these rates. And then what actually comes out, so this is, um, is that you actually see deviations. So you see, um, so these are all these reverse complement pairs of rates. Um, so you see that C to T and G to A, these rates should be e, uh, the same upstream of a gene, and they are. But as soon as you enter the gene body, uh, the, the uh, gene, uh, you actually see deviations. So that you see more C to T's than G to A's. And the same is true for the other transition process. Also, upstream of a gene, it's more or less the same, and then they, they, uh, they really get apart uh, from each other um, as soon as you are in the transcribed region. Um, and interestingly, the CPG process also have a, has a, a okay, it's, um, so this is this deamination process, which is often used. Um, so, it, okay, it, it has a different localization pattern. So it's also, this rate is also reduced in upstream of a gene and downstream of a gene, but just in the promoter region. But here you can clearly see that, okay, you have three spatial patterns. So there's one pa pattern which is up and downstream, one which is just downstream, but just localized 1 kb. One and then there's a, a delocalized pattern just in the full transcribed region. So just from, from this, you could uh, expect that there are actually three different mechanisms at work to, to uh, violate the symmetry. And we could uh, make, yeah, we, we could pinpoint some mechanisms which could be responsible for these patterns in our paper. Um, so, yeah, this is just one, two, three. So, but, okay, but, okay, n another thing I also want to show here is, okay, so we, we now have actually a microscope to actually, so, so what we can do is, okay, we measure rates and from there, from, from those rates, uh, we can actually infer something about evolutionary processes, right? So, and, and this was also possible in, in, a, in another study, so, Okay, there's something like uh, double strand breaks in, in, in the human and mouse genomes and all genomes uh, have double strand breaks and that's because they have recombination so they have to break somewhere uh, during, uh, during uh, mitosis. Um, and we have a good idea where these breaks happen and what we see then if we align all the genomes at, their, at these uh, breakpoints or at hotspots of double strand breaks, we actually see that the mutations around these hotspots are different. So that um, you have just right near the hotspot we have more weak to strong substitutions. So weak is AT to CG um, substitutions than 
the, uh, the reverse process, so from strong to weak, which actually has a dip here. So, so in principle, this is a very nice, um, so to say, method to, to or it's, it's an evolutionary microscope. You can look back into time and you can learn something about processes which uh, work on our genomes on evolutionary timescales. So, and, okay, this is here just exemplified on, on, ex uh, on these mutations. Okay, so I just want to switch to the second part now. Um, or do we have questions on this part? And the, the best thing is to ask them now, yes? Yes. No, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could also do that. But then, okay, but the matrices get bigger and bigger. And then actually, it, uh, the matrix exponential gets, uh, it takes more and more time. Because uh, the, 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 the computational effort to that uh, grows uh, more than linearly. Okay, there was another question. Um, how do you identify um, hotspots? Because it's not always just break, right? There certain yeah, um, hotspots. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so the question is how, how to identify hotspots. So, um, okay, there are websites for that. <laughs> no, okay, what people measure. <laughs> Okay, people, people, people sequence uh, different mice and they see, how, see where they recombined. And uh, from that data you can see, okay, where are the hotspots. And then there's also sequence motifs associated with these hotspots and you can also analyze them. So. I guess the question was whether using your, you know, looking at these biases, you could infer hotspots in the sequence. Ah, was that the question? Okay, the question is whether I can infer the hotspot from that. Um, and I would say no, because the, this, this bias is too weak to uh, actually uh, infer hotspots just from, I don't know. You would see a region where there's, I don't know, two more A to G mutations than C to A mutations. And I guess the signal is, okay, the, uh, that's too low. Okay. So stretch your legs. Okay, now we come to stick breaking. So, um, so this is rather recent work, and it also say, uh, started from a, from a, I don't know a figure like that. Um, so, because if you look closely, you would certainly realize that <coughs> <laughs> that there are actually in this in this uh, on that slide. Um, there's two times the same 67 nucleotide sequence uh, on that slide. And this is, uh, I don't know, part of the human genome. So um, how can that happen? That is the big question. So if, okay, we know that the human genome is mostly intergenic DNA and it's just <laughs> mutating along. Um, so if, if the human genome would be a random IID sequence, you would not expect to see any uh, not two copies of any sequence of length, say, 20. Um, but to see two sequences of length 67 is really astonishing. Is it coding or non-coding? No, it's non-coding. Yeah, okay, we, okay, yeah, we come to the biological uh, peculiarities on that, yes. <laughs> ah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, you're right. Shit. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> so, okay, so... Um, okay, to find these long matching pieces, what you, okay, what you have to do is you have to self-align the human genome. It's a dumb thing, you c I don't know, it's a dumb exercise you can ever do, but people did it 
And okay, so you, you align the human genome against itself. And so how do you do that? So, okay, everyone knows alignment? Yes, no, ah, okay. So, okay, you write the two genomic sequences on those axes, and then you, if there's a match, you just have, uh, you put a diagonal line in here. So, and then, okay, if you fill the whole grid, so, okay, this A matches with this A, with this A, with this A, with this A, and so on, and you fill all the grid, then you see already, okay, then what you see all these matching pieces. So, there's a, lo there's a lot of matches of length one, um, there's none of length two, but then there's a match of length four in here. Um, here, and of course along the diagonal, because the two sequences are the same, you also have a global match along the, uh, the main diagonal. So this does not occur if you, do, if you two take two different uh, genomes. Um, but okay, so, and now what we do is we just Okay, we, we are just interested in the length distribution of those exact matches. So, okay, I, I, don't, I don't allow for gaps and mismatches in my, in my matches. So, these are matching, identical matching sequence pairs. So, this AACG is actually occurs twice in the sequence. AACG, AACG. So I don't allow mismatches and I don't allow gaps, so which are usually allowed, I don't know, if you align genomic sequences. So and then I'm just interested in the, in the histogram of, of uh, lengths of matching pieces. So we have one match of length four and a lot of uh, length one. So, and we disregard the global match, it's anyway just one. Um, uh, okay. So I don't go into algorithmic details here. Okay, so if you, if you do this experiment, the self-alignment of the human genome, for, uh, for the human genome, you would actually see a grid, okay, this is now uh, a larger region uh, of the human genome, and all the black stuff are actually 100% identical matches longer than 30 base pairs. So these are uh, already very long pieces. And you can see that the grid is full of black pieces, so black, uh, black stuff. Um, so, and this is the length distribution. Um, so, so this is from a genomic sequence, as I, as I showed you from, from the slide before. Um, so, and we can, okay, this is on a, on a log scale here on the y-axis because we have a lot of those matches which are very short. And we can, we can, uh, from, we can actually, um, we know, okay, wh wh what is supposed to happen here for very short matches because if the human genome would be a, a random IID sequence, then the match length distribution would be just a geometric distribution where, okay, with some parameter p, where p is the, the probability to find a random match. And the, uh, the probability to find a, a, a run of, uh, of R matching base pairs, so it's just uh, P to the power of R, and then you have mismatches on both ends, so that makes 1 minus P squared uh, uh, as a common factor. So, and this is shown here with this red curve. So this part of the distribution we understand, we do not understand this part of the distribution. So we see a lot of matches which are much longer, much longer. So in a human genome, you would just see one match of say 20 base pairs, but you would not see anything larger than 20 base pairs. Even come from single chromosome, right? Yes, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess so. The, uh, a lot of them are close by, but they can also be somewhere else on the same. Okay, most of them come from nearby. Okay, we know the process which is acting for it. Okay, but I, I, okay, I come to some peculiarities. Okay, so, okay, on the other hand, okay, so, so we know a little bit of biology and we know that, okay, our genome is full of repetitive elements. 
So these are sequences, viral sequences, which came into our genome and today make up about 40% of our genome. So these are, say, sequences like ALU-J. So ALU-J, okay, it's a scary part of genomics. So this is this 300 base pair re uh, uh, repeat. And this, cop this sequence you find in 150,000 copies in our genome. So this is, and this came into our genome just before mouse split off. So, and it, these repeats and these copies of those repeats are just lying there and are just mutating. Sorry. Yes. Can we also distinguish this matrix associated regions, which are very big repeated regions, which are highly conserved. There are from a few hundred base pairs to a few KB. Yeah, we come to them. Um, so, okay, so there's a lot of those repeats. So, ALU S, 300,000 copies, double as much. And then ALU Y, just, I don't know, recently, so to say, in, in, in genomic, ter in, in evolutionary terms, uh, t uh, 100,000 copies. So, but of course, there are programs now which can just get rid of all these uh, repeat sequences. And if, so if we do this, and then do our history counting of uh, matches again, we see we still have some matches, uh, we, we still have some matches uh, after repeat masking. So a lot of those black stuff is gone, but there's still something left. And you can see, okay, these copies are, they are nearby, but there's also copies here which are a little bit farther away, like here and here. So, and these sequences are what is known to be segmental duplications. Um, so these are regions, where there's a region which is taken and copy pasted somewhere else. So now, but now the interesting stuff begins. Okay, so, so the black line was before repeat masking. Uh, yeah, the blue line is after repeat masking. So we still see a lot of, lot, a lot of long matches which shouldn't be there if we would be a random IID sequence. Our genome would be random IID. So this is this blue thing here. So, but this blue function here actually can nicely be fitted by this dashed line. Okay, you don't believe me now, but okay, this is log linear, uh, log linear plot because in this log linear plot, this uh, uh, geometric distribution is a straight line. Now, if we switch to a log log plot, you actually see that these matches, which are actually longer than you would expect, they fall on a straight line in a log-log plot, and the slope of this log-log plot, uh, of this uh, power, okay, so this is a power law, straight line in the log-log plot is a power law, and the slope of the power law is minus three. So why the hell is the distribution of exact matches in our genome, power law distributed with exponent minus three. Okay, unfortunately, <laughs> you don't have the answer. You get the answer in a minute. Okay, so Gao and Miller found this power law. <laughs> but it's, okay, it's very surprising, right? I don't know, you wouldn't expect something like that. I don't know, the distribution of exact matches in our genome. Okay, so, okay, selection could be responsible for that, but why should selection care about this exponent and why should it be minus three? No, it's just match, 100% identical matching, no mismatches. Okay, the... Uh, but it's, it's very easy to find a model for this minus three. So you just, okay, you just have to uh, see what, what is happening. Okay, if you have a segmental duplication process, so you copy paste a part of the genome from one location to another. So in such an alignment grid, what happens there, uh, so you copied this, this black piece here from here to here, you get, I don't know, a 100% identical matching say stick, I call it stick now, uh, here. So just after the duplication, there's a, a very long stick in this grid here. So this is, um, so then evolution turns on and okay, there's nucleotide exchanges. 
So what does a nucleotide exchange does? Okay, it exchanges, I don't know, this base. So it will break the stick here at this position. So out of one stick, you generated two sticks. Um, so and that is actually a very old model, a dynamic model of, uh, there's actually a very old model of stick breaking known. So, so you start with one stick and you just break the stick in time and you will accumulate more and more breakpoints uh, as you break the stick. And you can easily formulate, okay, you can, so let m of r and t be the number of sticks of length r at time t, then you can actually write down a nice differential equation for this quantity. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so this is the time evolution of, of stick lengths of length r, and then there's, again, there's a loss term. So, and here we come to my experiment. So, here's my stick. Actually, two sticks. Um, so, this is my stick of length r. Okay, and I can, I can lose sticks of length r if I just break the stick somewhere in the middle, right? So, then I lost a stick of length r, and now I have two sticks, but I lost the one of length r. Um, so, and this process can happen anywhere along the stick. So, and therefore we have, okay, there's a factor two because we have two copies of that stick lying around in the genome. There's a mutation rate mu and r, okay, is because I have r positions to break the stick in a, in a discrete model. Um, so, and that will break a stick. So, but we can also gain sticks of length r and we can gain sticks of length r if I take a longer stick and just break it at some special position which is r base pair, so to say, from one end. So I can break the stick here and I gained a stick of length r. So and I can do that for all sticks which are longer than my stick of length r. And therefore we have an integral there and of course it happens with the mutation rate but we just have, okay, but there's no factor r here because we, we can just do that at two positions. And then the, therefore we have a 4 there. Okay, so this is everything which goes on here. So there's no, okay, just for reference, so this stick breaking process is, was uh, developed by Kuhn in 1930s. This differential equation occurred in 1958, sometime after that. And the solution of this uh, differential equation is by Ziff and McGrady from 1985. 85. And it's this exponential function. So unfortunately, it's an exponential function and not a power law. Um, so where does the power law come from? So, okay, everything would be very nice if this would be a power law, but it's not. It's just an exponential function. Um, uh, okay, this is just, okay, so, so for diff, okay, this is log linear scale and for every, for, for every time, for any times you just have exponential distributions of stick lengths. So whenever you break sticks like that, um, you get an exponential distribution of sticks. So the power law actually comes from, from the fact that in our genome we of course have not just sticks of one age lying around but we have sticks of different ages, right? Every segmental duplication gives rise to a stick which then breaks apart. But there are very old segmental duplications and very young segmental duplications. So we just have to integrate, so to say, over the time they broke apart. And if we do that, and we can just do that in one line, so you just take this function, you integrate it over time, you just compute this integral and it exactly gives you this function. So there's no approximation to it, it's just k over mu to the r power of 3. So and that is the reason why we see a, a, a slope of minus 3 in the log log plot of the exactly matching pieces in the human genome. It's just this. And this exponent is actually uni universal, so it, it doesn't depend on any rates. So it's just three for all rates. Um, 
And okay, so you, you can do some more analysis. So okay, um, so okay, so the model is now a duplication mutation model. Um, so the only two ingredients is okay, you, you have duplication, so you duplicate a piece of length k uh, in a genome of length L, and you just out of one copy you make two, and you have mutations. And you can start with a random IID sequence and let it evolve for a long time. And then you would reach a stationary state where you have this minus three distribution. Okay, if you do that in this model, okay, if you have duplications, um, duplications would also occur with uh, some rate. So if you're in, in this stick breaking differential equation, you would have a source term here. So this, this is the equation as I explained it before, but you, you would gain the source term here, which injects um, sticks of length, R, uh, of length k uh, with some rate gamma. Um, and then you look for a stationary distribution, and then you, the stationary distribution actually looks like that. So it's, the function is um, gamma, gamma is the duplication rate over mu times k times l, 1 over r to the power of 3. Um, so what, why, uh, okay, let's skip this. Okay, you can do uh, simulations in a computer and you easily see those, um, see, see those um, power law tails in, in distributions and they all occur for, for various rates, so you can tune any of those rates and this just makes, I don't know, it, it doesn't change the exponent, as I said, the exponent is universal, it's just a prefactor of, uh, of this power law tail which changes if you change the rates. Um, so, and the only ingredient we, we used is, okay, that um, there is a continuous process which generates segmental applications. But, okay, but that is already known from biology. Um, so, okay, so that now, okay, so I just want to make one more point here. So, and, okay, so this is the, the this diagram I showed you for the whole human genome now. Um, so we see the red curve is the, is the random IID curve, and this is after repeat masking, and um, we see uh, this blue power law tail with uh, minus three slope. So, and the prefactor from our stationary solution is just gamma times k over mu, and it's so to say where uh, the the, um, the y uh, w where where this power law tail is on the y-axis, so to say, how high is it is. So, and uh, okay, I so let's call gamma times k over mu. Um, be A, and in principle we can think about this quantity as being the number of base pairs duplicated over the, so because gamma is the duplication rate and k is the length of the dupli dup duplicated segment over the mutation rate, mu. So um, what do you think, how, how large is this number? Um, so it's the number of duplicated G base pairs per time over the number of mutated base pairs in time. So and it, it's just, I don't know. So from this plot here, we see that this number is very close to one. So this is, uh, and the next surprise is, so why should the ratio of those numbers be more or less one? So and here I just have hand waving arguments because okay it makes sense because okay if say you have a you have a file on your computer and you want to preserve this file for any time so then of course you make back, backup copies right you know that okay some disk will fail um, there's a probability that a disk will fail, um, so I, I make a backup copy. So, and in, 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 on evolutionary timescales, we make as many backup copies of bases as we 
I don't know, mutate bases. Um, so this number does not need to be one for evolution to work, but somehow it is one. But as I said, I, I just have hand-waving arguments. Um, okay, we can also measure this number in other species, and there it, I, okay, okay, we can do the same analysis in other species, and we always see, uh, not always, but we very often see minus three power laws, so S here for mouse, um, so this is just the power law tail, and okay, this black line would be that this uh, prefactor would be one, so mouse has, I don't know, makes more backup copies than it would need to do. Um, so A is probably five, uh, but it's not, not much larger, it's not ten, right? So it's a little bit larger. Um, so this is the same picture in dark, also a nice power law with minus three slope, um, but now the prefactor is a little bit smaller than one. So it's not always exactly one as for human, so human would be more or less on the black curve, but a dog is a little less. This is a totally different genome, fruit fly, right? It's much smaller, therefore we have a lot more noise here in the signal because the matches are just smaller, uh, because the genome is smaller, but still the prefactor is more or less one. Um, warm, also a small genome, same power law, same prefactor. Okay, and that brings me to my last slide. So, uh, which is, okay, so I guess every scientist should have a nice uh, hypothesis which can be proven wrong in the future. Um, so, <laughs> my hopefully will stand a few hundred years. <laughs> but, okay, but if there's life on Mars or in, on this comet or whatever, wherever, and let's assume that, okay, of course, it's life on Mars or whatever, it doesn't know a DNA, right? DNA is probably just, I don't know, on Earth. So life on Mars is probably has, I don't know, another molecule. Um, but it, it, let's suppose that it, uh, we just assume that it's a linear molecule. So we have, a, if, if life on Mars is, uh, the heritable information is stored in a linear molecule, and say then, okay, we don't have to have four nucleotides, we can have six, five, whatever, um, then if we have M nucleotides, whatever nucleotides are, um, and if evolution happened by gene duplication, as it's uh, proposed by some evolutionary biologists, that is that the main process, or one, one of the major processes is actually that you copy-paste parts of your genome, then I tell you that that in this genome, even, okay, even if we have M nucleotides, then we should say, uh, see a power law exponent with min minus three slope in the distribution of exact matches in that genome. So that's my uh, hypothesis. Um, so now we have to go out there and sequence genomes. Um, okay. So at the very end, I, was, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, people in my lab. So the last part of the story was uh, mostly developed by Florian Massip. Uh, uh, he's uh, my shared uh, PhD student uh, at INRA, um, and Misha Scheiman, and these are other people in the, uh, in the lab um, who also worked on these uh, nucleotide exchange models. Um, yeah, and if you want to join my lab, uh, contact me um, because we are hiring. Okay, thanks. Yes. The, the copy number. Ah, if you overwrite a piece of a genome or no. no just ah, okay, yeah, yeah, but yeah, you can easily include that, but that would, okay, yeah. Um, but it, okay, 
this such a process if you do deletions that okay either they break a stick so because if you delete part of the stick then I don't know it still breaks the stick right I don't know even if you lose this part um, so you 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 could include this process also um, but it doesn't change um, the power law behavior or the exponent it just I don't know fills around with the with the prefactor Yes. Oh, I guess you were first. Too. Uh, in the past, it's known that there were more genome duplications. So presumably, they will, they will take huge sticks. Yes. And they will give you, uh, that would, they will be on the right side on the very long tail. So could you see them? You yes, we them? see them. Okay, I didn't show you the, uh, the picture about fish. But fishes have uh, whole genome duplications, and there, okay, we still see a power law with minus 3, but it's much higher, say, uh, a, a equal to 50, whatever. Yes, we see them. Yes? The sequence in life maps that you're showing, can you somehow relate it to the uh, chromatin capture maps, somehow to understand where they are located in space? Because there's one over exponent in cube, so in power of three, this would scale like as volume exponent in every direction of your space, then it's not so, uh, I mean, it would be logical why it scales as no, I don't think it's an effect from space. So, so okay. In in our model, okay, we we actually okay. In our computational model, we just take a random piece and put it somewhere else, um, and it still it, it still gives a minus three power law. So it, it's it's not from a spatial arrangement. So be. Even in, uh, in our differential equations, we don't care about where those sticks are lying around. The, all this information is lost and it's not taken care of, but still we get a minus three power law. However, we, we actually try to, to analyze this, this uh, high C data and to see, okay, to see where segmental duplications in the human genome land. Um, but, uh, yeah, but this is on the way, and I guess uh, Alvin Eichler did a lot of work in this direction as well already. So, maybe along this, this, uh, this direction, so general rearrangement would not change your, your picture? Uh, no, if they don't change the copy number, then they, no. Because we, we actually don't. Okay, in, in, in this differential equations, I don't care where, where my sticks lie around. Whether they are on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes, this information is lost to the distribution of stick lengths. So, um, so genome rearrangement, as, as long as they don't change the copy numbers of particular pieces, would not change anything. But it's true that, also, just to follow up on this uh, point, it's true that the application itself might be uh, biased towards a certain name. And in particular, you know, basically you need to, to have homologous regions uh, nearby, and if your genome is uh, kind of uh, compact, you expect this one of the RQ blow for the probabilities to, you know, different segments to contact. Yes. So this might obviously have, you know, bias the, some sort of the elementary duplication mechanisms in the genome in the first place. Yes. Maybe it's not related to SEC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. could be an alternative uh, model that should uh, be proven wrong at least. Yes, uh, okay, but it would be more a model of, okay, where, where do I find the, the piece? Okay, if I duplicate a piece, where do I find it in the genome? And I very often find it nearby, that's true. Um, and that's probably because those regions are, of course, more often in contact. Um, yes, but I mean, that's yet another yeah. that, that is already the, you know, the typical size of the duplication uh, segments uh, might enter into the, the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there other questions? Yes. Yeah. I hope so. 
you can join the lab. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I was just wondering, is there any relation to coding or non-coding DNA structures? Uh, yes, I think so, right? <laughs> um, Yeah, but of course they also have main coding stretches. Um, yeah. Um, but okay, yeah. yeah. But okay, coding parts make just a small part of our genome. So okay, w what I mainly talk about here is uh, non-coding stuff. But of course we see also segmented applications also take uh, duplicate coding parts. Um, and sometimes it's in the middle of an exon, but sometimes it's also an introns, whatever.